I will touch on four areas, a bit of background in terms of how the Play Standard tool became that particular product, share some of the approaches we use to deliver what effect is a tool at scale, both within Scotland but also now across Europe. So in terms of, of theory, um, I suppose it's just to reassure you that the definition that we are using for place will match up with your own, both in looking at the, the physical environment that we live in and the people who inhabit those places. And it's the quality of life that emerges as a, a consequence of that relationship. In terms of the content of the tool, it was driven very much through public health models, thinking of the origins of what creates our health and what generates equalities or inequalities in our society. So if you start from the left-hand side, you think about the fundamental causes of our health and well-being. What are the big global drivers? What's the norms within the societies that we inhabit? What are the political priorities that are constantly changing and are so diverse across this planet? And the pivotal role of equality and power, both at an individual, community, and of course, governmental level as well. These fundamental causes shape the environments that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, and those environments in turn determine what our individual life experience is. And depending on that flow of relationship will ultimately determine how well we'll feel on a day-to-day -day basis, how long we expect to live healthy for, what illnesses we will experience, and ultimately, when we'll die. So from a public health perspective, how do we manage that? Well, there are a range of, of, of different system interventions that we can apply, both in terms of employment, public services, communities, uh, progressive tax systems, the quality of housing, access to benefits. These are some of the system interventions. And then there's a human rights approach in terms of our ability to participate uh, in a, and be not discriminated against, feel empowered to shape the places in which we live in, where we learn and where we work, where we bring up our families. Um, the policy origins come from two main documents. The first, Good Places, Better Health in 2008 and then Creating Places, which was Scotland's policy statement on designing places in 2013. We also, within Scotland, have a set of standards for community engagement. What are the approaches that you adopt to ensure that all ages and all communities within our society participate fully in the process of designing our places? And finally, when we launched the tool in December 2015, we had strong political leadership at cabinet level to promote its delivery. So going back to the theory, you can see that the place standard tool was a political priority, but also equality and power was a legislative requirement within our city, eh, within our country, sorry. But it really was a, a consequence of architects, urban planners, and public health scientists coming together with various strands of theory and designing, testing, redesigning, retesting, so we finally got that, that product. It's a very simple, easy to use tool. It's to facilitate conversation between communities, organizations, businesses, and politicians. And it focuses the conversation around 14 key themes. Um, identifies the areas that require improving upon, areas that work well, and identifying the priorities for change. When you go into the tool, there's 14 themes and headline questions. And what we wanted to do was move away from jargon, make it a very accessible conversation. So you'll see in the first question, it doesn't act, ask about active commuting or green travel. It just asks, can I easily walk and cycle around using good quality routes? And I think anyone can have a conversation about the ability to walk or cycle or get around in, in, in a wheelchair or some other uh, mobility support. You could, you could split it into these four areas. One about getting around a place, 
things that we do within that area, the whole aspect of people, perceptions and culture, and finally, the whole aspect of how we manage uh, and govern the places that we live in. In terms of how you use it, you could do it one-to-one, -one, you can run workshops, surveys, um, so there's a whole range of different methods, but I'll show you some of those as we move into its practical application. As you can see here, the, the completion of the tool is about asking the question, having a conversation, <clears throat> and scoring between one to seven based on those discussions, where one needs a lot of improvement, seven less so. I've never had a full circle. That's virtually impossible to get. Um, and when you engage in workshop discussions, you're not always going to get agreement on what works well and what doesn't. Indeed, when you're working with different ages or having a, a workshop at a different time of the year, a different time of the day, the results will vary tremendously. But you do get there and you can get to some degree of, of, of consensus. Um, where you get an idea of the areas that need a lot of work and areas that need less so. But what's important is not to just take the quantitative results, focus on the quality of the conversation that lies behind those results to shape your, your thinking. So you're, you're, you get an idea of what works, what needs to improve upon. You get a range of priorities and new ideas for change. You'll be amazed at the amount of creativity that exists within communities. And of course, ultimately, of better informed plans for investment. Um, we clearly want to spend our money correctly on shaping our places. And this is one range of data to pull upon to make sure our investments are accurate uh, and match the priorities of the people who work, learn and live in those places. If you want to get an idea of how it's used at different scale, be it at settlement, um, neighbourhood or individual sites. If you go to the Architecture Design Scotland website and just click on that link, you'll get lots of really good examples of how it's been used there. But one example I'll show you is one in Dundee, which is a city on the, in the east of Scotland. Again, it's coastal, very similar to, to Porto. And this was a presentation made by a planning officer there. And with a traditional method of consultation to inform what they call a main issues report, which in turn informs the local development plan, the planning team went out, did consultations in libraries and in town halls, and this was the, the level of involvement that was created using the traditional method. Now, with the same level of resource, in the same amount of time, using the place standard tool, this was the spread of engagement that was generated and the massive increase in the range of ideas and opinions and priorities that was, that was created. So one of its big advantages is to is create a lot of data with the same level of resource and a far greater spread of data because it's, it's encouraging people to consider 14 key themes of what works well within a place. In terms of its international delivery, it all started in, in Slovenia. I, I was there as part of another workshop, but was given the opportunity to present to a WHO summer school. WHO liked it, they invited me to Hungary, and six months after that we ran an international master class for WHO Healthy Cities in Edinburgh. And from there it just began to grow. UK Healthy Cities Network were the first to take the work on and on another rainy day in Belfast um, leaders from across the city came together to, to learn how to use the tool and then roll that out to their teams. Turkey is now translated into Turkish. We've got a Norwegian project now, it's a Norwegian translation. German pilot working in Cologne, that will be ready in spring next year, and also we've got Greek and Spanish translation. Our colleagues in Switzerland are now going to be working up a French translation as well.
And within WHO, it is now one of the key tools for taking forward phase seven of the place dimension within WHO Healthy Cities. We've got a new strategy in place for the next three years. These are the five priorities that we will focus on. And the other piece of news I want to share is we will have three new versions, one new version of the tool, a children's version, and a design version for architects and planners to, to use. So almost there, um, I think the main impact for us is raising awareness and knowledge of place and, and, and public health theory um, across a range of, of partners um, and organisations. It translates quite complex theory into, into a practical tool and for better informed planning decisions as a consequence of this range of data it, it generates. And just finally to conclude, I've mentioned about the, the ability to translate complex theory. I've also mentioned its ability to align with the SDGs. Um, but I think what's, what's most important is its ability to place people at the heart of decision making around what works well and what doesn't work well work well within a place and for them to have a real voice in terms of shaping the future of their towns and their cities. Thank you very much indeed.